Good morning, Glencliff UMC. It is wonderful to be here with you in worship, knowing that God is everywhere that we are. And so if we are present with God, we are always with one another. We have some announcements we would love to share with you this morning. The first is we received an incredibly wonderful and gracious grant. Um, so if we have any members who are experiencing difficulties specifically because of COVID-19 regarding food, utilities, or rent, please contact the church so that we can be of assistance with you through this generous grant. We also are receiving a grant that will help us to pay for cleaning and congregational care supplies for the worship space for a return to worship. So we are on stay at home through at least the end of July. And as we are preparing to return to in-person worship, we are so thankful for this grant that allows us to ensure that we're caring for and with one another when we are gathered, however we gather. Uh, for those for whom this is an important need to know, Jim, our volunteer mission, is on sabbatical for the month of July. We're so thankful that he is taking his rest and his time with the Holy Spirit and look forward to receiving him renewed and refreshed when he returns in August. Last but not least, you uh, members should have received a delivery this week from either one of the pastors or from Nathaniel Bone himself, who said he enjoyed waving from the cars when he and his nurse uh, dropped off some of the packages for the month of July. So what you should have received was an upper room, a set of masks, because for those who haven't heard the news, we are on mandatory mask wearage for the city of Nashville now. So when you leave your home, um, it's not a request, it is a requirement in public spaces that you are wearing a mask because we are working to continue to reduce the spread of virus that comes from us not wearing them. Um, you should also be receiving a hymnal because we heard several folks we're very interested in having a hymnal for Sunday worship and also because this is a wonderful time to have the comforting songs of our faith with us. So everyone should be receiving a hymnal and that hymnal is our monthly Glencliff Edge, which also has some info on proper on it, wearing masks and making sure that we're keeping one another safe and caring for one another in with the spirit of God. And some lovely coloring pages for those who like to get their color on. And there's also information on housing and utility assistance. This is one of those things especially where if you don't feel it's for you, keep in mind who it may be for. We always remember that when God gives us something, it may be for us to give to others. So just keep in mind if there's anyone you know who may find this useful and you can pass it along to them. So, we have some birthdays that we want to celebrate this week. First up today, it is Pastor Luke's birthday. We're so excited. On Tuesday, July 7th, we will be celebrating Joanne Mitchell. And on Friday, July 10th, we will be celebrating Jimmy Guthrie. To all of you, happy and beloved birthday. We are so very thankful for the gift of your beings and lives in this world and in our community. Thank you, bless you all, and amen. Good morning, Glencliff. Um, as we enter together into a time of worship, um, please join me in our call to worship. We come, God of the journey, a people from different places, different histories, different lifestyles. We come hoping to find companionship for the journey, solidarity for the struggle. We gather God of hospitality around your welcome table, a table not yet round, but rounding. We gather seeking to become 
a round table people, welcoming of all with no preferred seating, no firsts and no lasts, and no corners for the least of these. We yearn, God of the rainbow, for a new way of living and relating, as neighbors, not strangers, as brothers and sisters, not them and us. We yearn to live fully, celebrating both the diversity of our human family and the unity of our call to love and justice. We hunger, God of abundant life, for lives that have meaning and integrity, and for relationships grounded in mutuality and respect. We thirst for places to bring our doubts, our fears, places to express honestly who we are. We thirst for hope and encouragement as we struggle to follow Jesus in a way of life-risking love. With the gift of your grace, we are nourished. With the promise of your presence, may we be strengthened to be faithful. Amen. Now together, if you have a candle at home, we can light this candle together as a symbol of God's presence with us. Amen. Hello, I'm Reverend Neely Hicks, and it's so good to be with you today. I pray that wherever you are in this world, that you are safe and secure. I pray that you feel the love of God upon you. Let us now go to the Lord in prayer. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, and for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy, for the peace and unity throughout the whole church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek truth, for our bishop, Bishop McAlilly, for all bishops, all other pastors, all around the world, for all who serve God, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, we pray, for Jackie Acton, who is moving to a nursing home, for Connie, who is in the hospital, for George Himes, who is in the hospital, for Pat Craig, who is at home recovering from illness. For Nathaniel Bone, as he continues on the journey of healing. For Thanksgiving, that Joanne's nephew will be returning home. For all of those prayers that are spoken or unspoken at this time, dear Lord, please receive these prayers and hear them in your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, and we exalt you and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. We pray to you in the name of Christ Jesus who taught us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Glencliff. Today's scripture reading is Jeremiah 
chapter 17, verses 7 through 14. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by the water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Like the partridge hatching what it did not lay, so are all who amass wealth unjustly. In midlife, it will leave them. And at their end, they will prove to be fools. A glorious throne, exalted from the beginning, shine of our sanctuary. O hope of Israel, O Lord, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be recorded in the underworld, for they have forsaken the fountain of living water, the Lord. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Good morning. It's my joy to come to you this uh, in this very unusual season, in this very unusual way, virtually, to share with you a reading from Jeremiah's Gospel and a message titled Growing Deep. Here, the reading from Jeremiah chapter 17, beginning at the seventh verse. Happy are those who trust in the Lord, who rely on the Lord. They will be like trees planted by the streams whose roots reach down to the water. They won't fear drought when it comes. Their leaves will remain green. They won't be stressed in the time of drought or fail to bear fruit. The most cunning heart is beyond help. Who can figure it out? I, the Lord, probe the heart and discern hidden motives to give everyone what they deserve, their consequences of their deeds. Like a partridge gathering a brood that is not its own, so are those who require wealth corruptly. By midlife it will be gone. Afterward they will look like fools. Splendid and exalted the place of our sanctuary from the beginning. Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will suffer disgrace. Those who turn away from you in the land will be written off. For they have abandoned the Lord, the fountain of the living water. Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, I will be saved. For you are my heart's desire. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me and for me now? O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter in every storm of life and our eternal home. We give thanks this day that we can gather for worship in a virtual way and share this message. This morning I prayed for the congregations of the Tennessee and Memphis Conference. I pray that those who are sharing this time together will find a word of hope and healing and blessing. Speak to us now, Lord, and give us your strength. Let us be like a tree planted by the water whose roots grow deep. And now may those who are gathered today hear you and not me, see you and not me. And when we give thanks over this day, may you receive all the glory. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. For six years, I lived among the live oak trees on the Mississippi Gulf Coast after Hurricane Katrina devastated our coast. In fact, weekly, I would drive down Highway 90, which was known to the locals as the Beach Road, and I would marvel at the majesty of those live oak trees where there were hundreds, if not thousands, of those massive trees. They were massive in scope and scale. These majestic massive evergreen trees. Did you know live oak trees were among the evergreen trees? Who ever dreamed that that would be the case? A live oak tree is the dream of every child who ever wanted to build a tree house in a tree. Their leaves are long and low, and you can get climbing those trees forever if you had opportunity. 
If only I'd had a tree like that when I was a child in my yard, I would have been so pleased. One of the interesting things I learned while living there was amongst those massive trees was the reason that they were so strong, grew so tall, stretched so wide, and offered such great shade was that the root system was deep and wide. We know the central root system of any tree is the tap root, but in a live oak tree, it's called an anchor root. It literally anchors the tree deep, then grows wide with a root system that stretches around and around the tree, often four to seven times the diameter of that tree. Can you imagine a root system that massive? Unfortunately, after Hurricane Katrina, some of those massive live oak trees died. It's been almost 15 years since the storm. And yet one can still see the remnants of hundreds of those trees dying that died from the border of Louisiana to Alabama across the Mississippi Gulf Coast along the Beach Road. Some creative artists came along with a, a chainsaw and carved figurines out of the dead trees, turning a thing of death into a thing of life, a thing of beauty, a tourist attraction. I wondered if that might be a metaphor for where we see ourselves in the church today, some congregations deeply rooted, engaged in mission and faithful discipleship, and others once beautiful places of vibrant, vital communities, now artifacts, even close to museums. There are many causes of such decline in trees, too much water, lack of proper nutrients, too many storms, and congregations. Maybe it's an unwillingness to engage the neighborhood with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so I ponder that question in this season I pray, Lord, are we rooted deeply enough in you that when the drought comes, when the storms come, we will continue to bear fruit? Well, the roots of my faith and life come from places where water is plentiful and gray trees grow large and tall, roots grow deep and branch out. I've learned over time, however, that storms will stunt, heat will scorch, and fruit is sometimes scarce. Is it possible, is it possible that in this season of COVID-19 and the racial pandemic that we find ourselves in a season of drought? Well, along comes this word from Jeremiah who says, blessing comes when the root, one's roots in one's life are trust, trusting in the Lord. Now, the Old Testament theology does not distinguish greatly between trust and faith. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not in thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. When Lynn and I were married, a friend gave us a needlepoint of those very words. One of the interesting things is that the day that we moved into the Episcopal residence in Nashville, that very plaque, a plaque with those very same words, was resting on the desk in the Episcopal office. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not onto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will, he will direct thy paths. Seems like an easy thing to do, just to trust, just to have faith. Well, Jeremiah did not have a great support group. He did not have a congregation around him that was cheering him on, encouraging him, saying, hang in there, don't give up, press on. I wonder if he had not been on his own, if he had a group around him, if he might have said things a bit differently, prophesied with less vim and vicar. Somebody would have talked him out of saying some of the harsh things that he said, but times were desperate. He was passionate. In fact, if you catch the first six verses of chapter 17, he wasn't doling out blessings, just curses, which these days, if you're paying attention, you understand quite well. I think about the agony, the lament, the pain of the families of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Philando Castile and others. In Jeremiah's time, there was turmoil and exile. Hearts were hardened. The enemy lurked just outside the gate. He longed for more for his people. He longed for them to be planted deeply in the Lord, to place their trust in God. He knew that if he could call on his people to a deeper life, a more faithful trust in God. When the hard times come, and they surely will come, as surely as I am speaking to you this morning, they will come. He knew that if he was grounded, if one was grounded deep in the heart of God, not one's own heart, 
but the heart of God. The dry seasons would come, but fruit would still be born. Like Jeremiah, we are in an awesome and definitive moment in the history of the church and the world. When Jeremiah comes on the scene, there was great anxiety in Jerusalem. In 587 B.C., the party's over. We're paying attention to our rhetoric and to our activity. We're caught in a similar place of anxiety in the midst of these dual pandemics of COVID-19 and racism that people who look like me have difficulty understanding. We wonder what will become of us, what will become of the world, what will become of the church. We ask, when when will people stop dying? We ask how many people have to die. When we think of COVID-19, we know, many of us know, persons who've had to die alone, loved ones separated by a wall or a door, exiled from the hospital room. And we grieve with those in our family who've lost loved ones. In the midst of all of the COVID pandemic, in the midst of all the racial strife in our world right now, we still have other issues that capture our attention. We worry about the unemployment rate in our country. We worry when the country will open up and our economy will return to normal. How long, O Lord, we pray, how long will this go on? When the Physical and social distancing first began, I really had a hard time with the thought that I was going to have to stay home indefinitely. In fact, Lynn and I had a, quite a number of conversations about whether I could go out or whether I could play golf or where I, whether I could go to the grocery store. I joked, I said, well, she's got a, a leash around my neck with a 12-foot rope, and any time I get too far out, she just pulls me back in. I wondered how long this would go on. Well, here we are, three months later, worshiping virtually still some of us, seeking to be rooted in something deeper, something more profound than just what we know, what we experience. Well, here Jeremiah is speaking. He's speaking in a time of great need for the people of God. And he steps on this stage of biblical history. He's rooted in the old memories of Moses those deeply rooted faithful stories of Moses as they're mediated in the teaching of Deuteronomy. The covenant, the covenant was central to all that Jeremiah taught and all that he believed. The covenant's deep, it's demanding, it's intimate. It is intimate because it creates a relationship between us and God. Jeremiah's words must have been as shocking to the people who believe that you should only etch divine or good things on the heart. But the central passage of one of their central books in Deuteronomy provided as follows. Keep the words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Write them on your heart. Oh, in the church, we try to clarify our mission We speak of making disciples of Jesus Christ only to discover that we're one step forward and two step back. We get crossed up with one another because we differ theologically on how best to navigate this changing cultural landscape. Some of us feel called to be prophetic. Others of us feel called to hold attention so that we can uh, wait on God to reveal a solution. Others of us feel strongly that God has spoken. What are we to do? How shall we navigate this impasse? We agree to disagree. We bend our covenants. But do we deepen our roots in Christ and in one another? And here comes Jeremiah, a poet who is acutely sensitive to the pain and failure of his community. When the dressing was not going to address the problems Judas faced. And when the dressing was not, would not be adequate for facing our differences in our context and beyond. And so Jeremiah sets out to tell a better story to help Israel live a better story, to reposition and reimagine a better future in terms of commitment to Christ or to God and reliance upon God between a blessing and a prayer, Jeremiah speaks. He says our trust in God draws us to trust in each other as rooted in God's hope and His love that we are called to exhibit. That's what it means to be a Methodist, to be rooted in God's hope and to love as the people call Methodist to trust in one another. Blessed is the one whose trust is in the Lord, says Jeremiah. Heal me, Lord. Heal me, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. 
one of the several that Jeremiah prays really is confession, this prayer. He prays out of hurt. He prays out of grief. He prays out of anger and a sense of acute danger. He prays. I too am praying right now. In this cultural moment of divisiveness in this country, I pray, how shall we be the church? What is your heart's desire? How will we hold this tension between doing no harm and doing good? The constrictions of the human condition force us to acknowledge our ultimate powerlessness. Nothing, nothing is sufficient for us except God. And so we must risk to be a part of the story. We can trust in ourselves, our priorities, our strength, and become like a shrub in the desert with no relief, living in parched places of the wilderness. Or we can listen to Jeremiah, who calls us to place our trust in the Lord, who is the fountain of the living water. So that we're like a tree planted by the water whose roots grow deep in loving God and loving what God loves. We often feel powerless up against this virus. A virus we cannot see in a world that's increasingly conflicted. But here's what we know. The only way out is through. And the way through is to surrender to God. I don't know about you, but for me, I get an A in control. For me, it's incredibly difficult, this notion of surrendering. Every day I wake up and pray, Lord, today I will surrender. But by lunchtime, I'm large and in charge again. I'm back on my, in the driver's seat, my hands gripped to the steering wheel. But is this, what, is this what Jeremiah's after in this prayer for healing? Is it to surrender? Oh, I think it's more than that. I believe Jeremiah is calling us to a deeper life, a deeper place than we have been. Shall we be so bold as to proclaim that we have all the answers? On the one hand, we don't want to give in on moral issues. On the other hand, we don't want to give our way away our need to be right, to be superior, to be in control. When I hear those words coming out of my own mouth, I immediately think of original sin. But listen to the words of Thomas Merton. Lord, I don't know if I've ever done your will. All I know is that I want to do your will. I'm not certain I'm pleasing you. All I know is that I desire to please you. Isn't that what we all desire? To live in God's will like a tree planted deeply rooted and grounded in God's love. I've told some of you the story of my friend Tom Turner who lives in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Tom inherited the task of running his father's hardware business. It was not his calling but it was his task, his job that fell to him. Tom and I would have long theological conversations about God's will and what God wanted him to do with his life. And Tom would say to me, Bill, if, if I just knew what God's will was for me, I would have no trouble doing it. Well, Tom finally crossed over to the other side of the bridge and he let go of the hardware business and he started doing the thing that he loved and was passionate about, which was coaching and teaching high school students, tennis and soccer. And he gave his life to that. And he had joy and a peace that passes all understanding. To live in God's will is to be like a tree planted by the water, deeply rooted and grounded in God's love. I don't know where you find yourself on the theological continuum right now, but I do believe that we are called to a mystery of transformation. It's a mystery, this life with God in Christ Jesus, who for the sake of all of us walked the way of suffering all the way to the cross. So when we place our lives before the cross, none of us is in charge, none of us is in control, nor was Jesus. On the cross, someone else is in control, someone else is in charge, someone else understands. After Hurricane Katrina, many of our congregations were no longer in control. Somewhat similar to this season when we can't gather in our buildings, when we're socially distancing, we had to find a way forward. And I give thanks to God for the beautiful way 
All of our congregations have found a way to be adaptive and nimble in this season of physically distancing, not being in the building, but living and worshiping and connecting in this way. To be sure, we're not in control. Stuff after the storm was, after Hurricane Katrina, stuff was destroyed. Cars were turned upside down. Houses were destroyed. Churches were destroyed. All we had was each other. And in some ways, we're in that same moment right now in this kind of storm we're living in. All we have is each other. Oh, there's a storm brewing. In some ways, it's a storm like we've never seen before. It's a storm we cannot control. But at the end of the day, if we fail to hold on to each other, if we fail to surrender to God, if we fail to be deeply rooted in the deep love of Christ Jesus, we will miss the grand opportunity that lies before us. The question I am living with today is this. How shall we live together? And what shall our witness be? Jeremiah said it this way, heal us and we shall be healed. Save us and we shall be saved. And then, then our hearts shall be pure. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us continue to worship together this morning in our time of offering. This is a time where we can respond to the word of God that we've just heard in recognition and awareness that everything that we've been given comes from one source and we are just asked to give a small portion of that back to God, not out of obligation, but out of love and gratitude for what God is doing in our life. You're able to click on the link on the Facebook page if that's how you're connecting this morning or continue to mail in um, checks or money to the church and the address will be shown on the following slide. Let us go to God in prayer. Blessed is the one, Lord, who has confidence in you. We, as your people, worshiping you this morning are confident that you will continue to supply the needs of both our families and our communities and that you would go beyond your your grace and your love goes beyond um, our capabilities and our understandings to everyone God let these gifts that are given unto you this day multiply in such a way that people would be blessed and that your kingdom continues to build on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Friends, thank you for joining us this morning at Glencliff United Methodist Church. You are always welcome here. And as we go out into the world in the love and light of Christ, let us remember how we hold each other together, how we are a community of people interdependent on each other. And when we remember that, let's be reminded to share our light and love with all of those we meet, whoever we meet in whatever circumstance. May the peace of Christ dwell in your heart this week and forevermore. Go in peace.